Welcome to Unknown Pressures, a series about music and mental health. I'm Maureen Mancini, as um, I was just lovely introduced introduction there. And today the wonderful Tom O'Dell is our very first guest. Tom is one of the leading singer-songwriters in the country, who has four top ten albums, has won Critic Choice Awards at the Brit Awards, Ivan Novello Award, and we're delighted to have him here to talk about his experiences in the music industry, why he's gone independent, and of course how he deals with mental health in his life and work. Give a big round of applause for Tom O'Dell. How are you doing, Tom? Good, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for today. Pleasure. Um, I'm going to kind of roll back to the beginning. Where did your love of music start? Uh, 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 my love of music started when I was four years old, and I was I have a very vague memory of seeing a band. And I was mesmerised by the band, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to do. We have to know what band that is. They were like a wedding band, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were they playing? I don't remember, but <laughs> it was, um, I think it was, maybe not a wedding band, but they were like a, a sort of function band or something like that. They were... Um, I don't, I, it's like one of those weird dreamy memories that may have not even happened, but it seems, it seems like uh, that's, that's my first musical memory. And I, maybe there's like a photo of it, it looks like a band on a bandstand or something. But yeah, that's, what, what, about, what about yourself? Oh, gosh, when it's thrown back to me, I go blank. That's the, <laughs> I think, um, I used to listen to lots of old records, and Ella Fitzgerald for me, I think, her voice for me was right. enchanting. I think I felt quite emotional actually hearing her voice quite young. Right. Um, my dad was a musician, so he played me loads of really good music, so I'm very lucky I had a good education. Right. Um, he's not Mancini, is in like. He's not Henry Mancini. Henry Mancini. I wish, I wish. I do like Henry Mancini. Yeah. But um, no, he's not. Is but he related yeah. to Henry Mancini? <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's not. But, but sometimes if I've had a drink, I do tell people that. Right. <laughs> it's not such a common name, I don't think, is it? It's Manchester. not. It's Italian. So I've got Italian. half Italian side. So, right. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So that's, what I, that's what I heard. And then I played a piano. I started on piano like you did as well. Right. I hear. So. Awesome. What steered you towards that? Piano? Yeah. Um, my... Uh, so my gra my grandma had a piano. She had a pianola, which was a kind of um, I guess it like preceded the gramophone, and you would um, pump the pedals with your feet, and then you'd put like a, a a scroll or something in it, and it would play itself. And uh, sport was incredible like this thing it was like it was like an invisible man was playing the piano in fact they're so mind-blowing these things have you ever seen those things where like the modern version of it is just just got like a box mm. on a grand piano and then the keys play themselves yeah it's so mad that technology it's, a, like, it's amazing how much work went into creating music as well yeah. you know how now it's so easy easily accessible yeah but back in the day you'd have to learn to play it to listen you know yeah 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 it's kind of kind of nice yeah i guess yeah. the thing that i think about is that like as you said it's it was so accessible but music must have, people must have had such a different relationship with it because mm -hmm. you couldn't just hear it um when you wanted to it was like someone had to sing or perform it or before the gramophone but yeah do you remember your first songs you wrote uh yeah uh, like when i was yeah i remember like the first melody yeah can you say that it, w <laughs> <laughs> it was like it went da, 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 da. <laughs> look up to the sky and now i see a bird in the blue oh <laughs> it's a hit. <laughs> oh, 
Um, so you started writing songs, and you know, I, so your parents musical as well. Or? No, so my my grandparents and my no my grandmas on both sides both played the piano, and then I had an uncle that played the piano. So it was like I feel like it was far enough away that it felt sort of exotic, mm. but it was close enough that I could you know learn from them, I guess. So it was a good, I think it was, a, it was a sort of correct, I don't know, I like, because I got on really well with my grandparents, I love my grandparents so much, so they were, they were dead now, but they, they were, I had a really strong relationship with them, so I really looked up to them in a way that, perhaps you can't look up to your parents, although I, look, I do look up to my parents, I love them very much, but the distance that you get from a grandparent means you love them in a particular mm. way that you, you couldn't love like a, you need your mum too much to love her in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I guess everyone's relationship is different, but... Yeah. Well, one thing that struck me about you is that you you had a lot of success very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You were really young. You know, you had um, an Ivan Novello Award at 23, which is, I mean, as a songwriter myself, is... Uh, a dream come true. Right. How did it feel to kind of have that so young, all of that? Um, yeah, it was great. It was, um, it felt really nice. Uh, yeah, I think it just felt good. It felt mm -hmm. nice. Like, I, I think I worked very hard up to that point, so it was like, it wasn't overnight, like, I was... <clears throat> from 15 or 15 I was I was obsessed with writing songs and playing in bands so it was like it felt like a sort of decade before but yeah it was probably quite a lot to deal with and looking back like I think probably found it more overwhelming than I would have liked to have admitted at the time but does it feel a bit like a dream all of that all of that well, I still does. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I don't I don't know. Like I think. Yeah, it feel it, it, yeah. It felt mm. it felt like a, it feels like a blur now. But then everything always does in the past to some extent. I mm. think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But it was I was very happy with it. Obviously, mm. at the time. Did you feel like you had a lot of support at that time? Um. Yeah, I think I think so. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I like I had friends and people yeah. I worked with, but like I don't know. Yeah, I'd say I'd say to some extent. But it's quite a unique thing to go through. So it's difficult to it's difficult for someone to try to understand. Mm. I couldn't really talk to my friends or family about it because no one was no one had become an international <laughs> pop star before <laughs> you and you one of the great greatest singers of all time <laughs> only I room agree. for one I agree <laughs> <laughs> no I but like it's a unique thing I come from mm. Chichester I, and certainly didn't know anyone growing up so it's very alien did you have anyone in the industry who supported you that you felt you could talk to? Because it's quite an important part, isn't it? It's having people on the same boat as you. Yeah, I think, not really, no. I mean, obviously I had like my manager who is, you know, always been brilliant and, but, and the label at the time were good, I think. But they're all taking a cut, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a limitation, even doesn't matter how good willed or brilliant, magnanimous they are, there's still an element of business to it. I think, like, no, I, don't, I, I think there was. No, I don't. To, to, be, to be completely honest with you, at the beginning, you don't know many people, even though you sort of do, but you don't, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 
Mm. Talking about um, a record label, were there expectations and any pressures that you felt in that situation? You've already kind of explained that it's a certain relationship you have with them, but did you feel? Oh yeah, huge amount of pressure. You did. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and and a huge amount of pressure to to do well and to succeed and. Uh, most of the time, during those first couple of years, I felt like a failure. Actually, ironically, I'd say it was because you constantly being compared to people that are doing way better than you, and um, you know that the way that major label system works is to, I think. It leads to the artist quite commonly feeling somehow uh, like they aren't good enough, uh, or they're not selling. Yeah, because there's never, there's always someone more successful than you. Ironically, I'd say as I've gotten older and you know been on the TV yet less, I feel more successful. Wow, that's interesting. Because I think. I don't like I just I, I compare myself less to other people I think if you just you know set your own goals it's just yeah well it's that thing of having a lot of success and then it then having more pressure almost because you're trying to kind of stay there and then there's yeah. pressures to do that and you're competing against so yeah. much whereas if you pull yourself out of that game a little bit perhaps it's it's less bad bad on your mental health you know yeah mm. yeah i think i think i think the crazy thing about the music industry is like not to is and that is what we're talking about isn't it today is the yeah. music industry like, yeah. like i think the, i think the crazy thing about it is like you've got a bunch of old people usually <laughs> older people <laughs> making shed loads of money from a bunch of 21 year olds mm -hmm. I'm like obviously you know some right you know um, um, what's the word uh, you know whittling down but mm -hmm. not every experience is like that but a lot of them are and that is a very strange dynamic doesn't matter how you spin it like it is a bizarre and it's it, at what point I think quite easily it can become quite, I think extortion is too much of a word, but like the, the very, but you know, there's so many elements of that in, in the arts and in capitalism in general. So it's like, but I got into it and still remain, I, I hope and I think quite innocently like I just love art I love music love writing songs love playing with my band and in all honesty I wasn't really that bothered about selling records or being successful I think there's still the feeling from my band and I every gig that you can sit in the dressing room and you can hear there's a crowd of, of you know there's a, a full room out there you, you genuinely feel very present and go, wow, I feel really lucky. It never goes away. Like, that's fucking great. I can't believe people want to come and see me. Mm. Like, but, and you've got to keep that element of uh, gratitude. And, and you do when you're healthy. I think what's, what the major label and a lot of, music industry has become so fucking cynical and all they want to do is make money and it's this it's this where art meets commerce yeah it's two totally different come yeah completely different spaces two completely different sets of ambitions mm -hmm. and i think sometimes it can work quite harmoniously and other times it can work you know you look at like you watch like the amy winehouse film or stuff like that and it's just like tragic because you're just like they just worked this poor suck her dry, yeah. artist into the you know literally into the grave I mean it's awful and you can see how that you can see how that sort of thing happens and no one looks around and goes is 
you know, no one checks the, the, the moral mm. uh, quality of what they're doing. Do you think if you could give yourself some advice, perhaps when you were in that moment yeah. now, what, what would it be? What, back when I was younger? Yeah. Uh, stop with that weird haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> hasn't really got it back. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. But How, when we're talking about sort of, you know, your music and how much you love hearing the crowd and the other room and all that stuff, what is your experience of touring, being on the road, Obviously, a lot of people talk about the very high highs and lows. And what's your experience, your personal experience of gigging? I lo like I love it. I love it so much. Mm -hmm. I love every element of it. I I um I love it. I just finished a tour a week ago. It's like just, it was so magical. The whole thing. Uh, I love the I love the the sort of the day of like you wake up and you've got this like thing at the end of the day that everything is kind of preparation for this thing and it's not and you don't really know how it's going to go you don't know if it's going to be like good or bad or even like maybe what the room's going to be like or the it, anticipation the excitement yeah. all of that yeah, like I live for it. I love it so much. I think it's so awesome, mm -hmm. and I love the sort of showbiz element of it as well. Like all the, the, the lights and the, the. I don't know, like the. I don't know. I just really love it. I love ele every element of it. I think I love it more and more as well as time goes by because it's so. It's such a beautiful thing. It's like. Like I know people have phones at gigs and stuff, but even with the phones, it's just like, it's so like present and everyone is just like, there's not, you don't walk away with anything material. And it's, it's so not, there's nothing, it's not like consume, it's not like fast food, it's not like <coughs> going to the shop. It's like, it's so untangible and, and it, you're buying a, 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 an experience and you lose all track of time and and you've got people from all walks of life from so many different situations of you know even just their day or where they've come from or and yet they all have this shared experience it transcends all the things that try to divide us I think it's so beautiful and it's so nice to be a part of like the good bit of someone's day rather than like, it's the opposite of being like a parking ticket man. <laughs> <laughs> like that's like the worst bit of someone's day, giving someone a parking ticket. Like being a musician, you get to... Bring joy. You get to be like the good bit. Mm. Um, Do you think because you have those amazing highs on stage, and as you said, it feels like an out of body experience almost, that with that you come down at some point? Yeah. Do you notice that? Yeah, definitely, and that's where like it's that's where like there's all the you know. I guess that whole like, rock and roll image comes from really difficult. I mean, I've heard Chris Martin talking about it before. Of like literally, like he's like at one of his big stadiums and he's does a gig and then he gets in a car and then like twenty minutes later he's like in his hotel room and there's no one and it's just like he's staring at the walls but definitely like doesn't matter how big your gigs are it's definitely like it's the weirdest part of the job mm. it's like coming down from it and that's quite an alien experience for, yeah. for a normal person isn't it to have that yeah i guess it's sort of a bit more of a roller coaster mm. um i reckon that's why as well you know a lot of people kind of take to alcohol and drugs yeah, yeah. just to kind of keep that feeling and, and get, a, get rid of that loneliness in a way yeah you know yeah 
Do you think, why do you think it's so long? I, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> of the beer in hand. <laughs> that's <Rumors>. not me. <laughs> um, but why do you think it is, do you think that's why it's so normalised in, 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 in the music industry? Alcohol and drugs and that kind of, as you said, rock and roll. Is that what it is, do you think? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. I guess it's part of the sort of nihilistic, like, you know, fuck it, like, mm. good time, like, I guess, I guess it is rooted in that, but yeah, I mean, I've definitely done tours where I've drunk way too much. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, you know, but uh, I'm a bit better at it now, I think. How, how, what ways do you make it better for yourself now? Do you think? Drink less. <laughs> <laughs> That's simple. Just drink less beers. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I, you know, I, I don't want to, like, be in... I'm, I think I'm going to stop short of sort of being... You know, it's an indulgent thing. I think it's, you know, I'm just like, come on, you can't... It's just too self-indulgent um, to do, to be... You can't keep the party going, you know. But I think actually these days, like, not to sound like some sort of Zen master, but like I'm, I do quite a lot of meditation on tour, and I, <coughs> before, I mean I haven't done a gig in the past five years, which I haven't done twenty minutes meditation before, and I feel like that set. It sets me in a much, although like the shows are very, like, you know, sort of exciting, it's still just like, you, you I'm aware of the excitement and, I'm, and I can be aware of it as I walk off as the excitement fades as well, if you know what I mean. Do you, do you meditate before and after or just not, before? Not after, yeah. but like. But I feel like the bit before is important, you know. Mm. I think it sets you up for a nice... How long ago did you learn? Yeah, I learned in 2016 um, with the D- at the David Lynch Foundation. And I've done it pretty much. Yeah. 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 Do you do it as well? I don't. No, well, I do re- I do um, Reiki. Right. Know, so, yeah, oh, nice. a meditation, but not the same one you're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, I, f- I found that to be a real gift yeah, yeah, yeah. too because uh, I do music as well so yeah. I know the feeling completely yeah. changed my life so yeah. yeah so it's good to hear that yeah um, how the dressing room has changed eh meditation before <laughs> yeah yeah um, do you ever read any sort of reviews about your performance or anything or do you just totally switch off after you've been on tour uh, is it something that you entertain as an act of sort of self harm yeah. Well, we all do it, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Occasionally, like I follow a few like uh, fan sort of accounts, which is definitely the most sort of self indulgent <laughs> thing you can do. <laughs> the ones, <laughs> but, yeah. But they're very nice people, and mm. sometimes I learn things about things. Mm. Um, and sometimes they post that, that so I sometimes see that, but but I don't, I don't. I don't tend to look for reviews on my. Oh. oh did I do that? Oh. There we go. The bag. <laughs> yeah, um, the. Uh, the my last album, like, uh, that came out, Monsters, I mean, because it was the. It was, I feel like it was quite a painful listen mm. for some people. Like, both. Well, maybe emotionally but also just people found it not very nice which why do you say that not very nice i think it's quite an abrasive album mm. like like i like i think it is like I, I think it is like i think if i was to review it now i would i would probably say that but i definitely read some some of reviews that weren't very nice about it and i think that was quite hard on that day because i was like I definitely like went in. I read one, and I was like, "Fuck, I'm gonna read them all." Yeah, and then I was well, because like, it's, it's a personal. Like I've had the sounds of it, it was a really personal album. So yeah, if someone doesn't like that. That's gonna hurt more than. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it always hurts when mm. someone's writing something nasty about you. Mm. But I feel like with like journalists, like when I started in music, it was like they had a hell of a lot of power. Like it was definitely still the sort of era where like a journalist could break an artist with like one great article about the one I always think of is like Elton John at the Troubadour. It's like there's that famous story of like I think it was like the L.A. Times, the New York Times, they like exploded Elton John in America. It's like to think of a a newspaper doing that now is like strange. But even when I first got into it, it was like I was talking to my manager about it the other day. It's like still some bands we managed to like got one bad review and it was their career over. There was still a little bit of that. I guess the internet has turned into that, really, hasn't it? Yeah, well, I feel like now it's sort of like they don't really. Uh, well, they just don't. It's just. It's. I think it's a pretty hard job to do now, for music journalism. I think, like, you know, I think it's difficult. It just seems to me there's less and less, and I think it is an important. Uh, you know, I think I read something about like any arts writing should be there you know originally was there to encourage people to consume the arts it was there to sort of funnel down all of the things that came out that week and encourage people to listen to these three things you know it's like a positive thing but I think there was certainly a period like the beginning of my career when journalists were beginning to catch on that their sort of potency was being reduced and they started writing these like horrendous things about people like like I guess trying to be like divisive or um, you know and draw attention draw attention <laughs> and I definitely feel like I was on the receiving end of, of a few of those things and it was like I definitely found them like in this age of um, in this age we're in now I wonder whether that would happen um, I feel like there was I feel like there would be perhaps more uh, consideration before writing you know you think back to like the 90s or 2000s and it's like yeah. f- some of the stuff these people wrote about people it's like crazy I know um, you know like about like I remember being young and there being magazines with you know celebrity females on the beach with circles around cellulite on their legs yeah st- you know, like really now magazine just awful yeah. horrendous I remember there was a period of time where it's just trying to bring everyone down constantly yeah I mean that must have really you must have you know must have affected you quite a lot having things like that written yeah definitely I, f- yeah. I think I I have a I think I have a deep distrust of journalists mm. because because of it like I don't me. I don't feel um, like I feel like it's almost just completely counterproductive for me to do an interview with a journalist now because I I freeze up right as yeah. soon as I start well, talking. Well, that makes like, sense. You would do because so. every other time they've sort of you know it, um, yeah. So you you brushed upon we were talking about um, your last album Monster mm. the song you wrote was about anxiety mm. and you had a, um, an experience uh, where you were rushed to hospital mm. do you mind telling us about what happened yeah sure so um so i was having these uh panic attacks and i didn't know what they were and um which seems insane to me now because i've like met so many people that have had them and it seems like such a part of I don't know, I just, it seems strange that I didn't know what they were, but I genuinely didn't know what they were. I thought, I thought a panic attack was like someone breathing in a paper bag, you know, like in a, like 90s Hollywood films on planes and stuff. Um, but I was getting all these like strange symptoms where I'd be like, I'd start, I'd like almost black out and stuff. And I got more and more freaked out about it and started feeling like dizzy and then, and then I was in Munich and uh, I was in the shower and I just like couldn't breathe and it was like it was really I mean sure maybe some of you in here have had panic attacks like it was so terrifying 
like possibly the most terrifying you know feeling I've ever had and I didn't you know I, I, I couldn't catch my breath I guess because I was so now you know because I was hyperventilating so much um, so I ended up working myself up my but I ended up working my body up my heart up into such a frenzied state that I, it wouldn't go down and then uh, the, my heart rate wouldn't go down and then this really stupid really just ended up in hospital and, uh, I had the same experience so did you? Yeah, for the I, first time um, yeah I had um, I ended up having uh, an operation I had to assist with my ovaries but nice. I didn't know what it was and I was in pain and I did get panic attacks because right. of the pain I didn't know where it came from right. and I had one in particular I went to hospital when I when I literally nearly passed out and the room was spinning and I saw spots everywhere and I couldn't catch my breath and I had no idea. I thought I was dying, basically. Right, yeah. So, um, and that's when I first discovered I had them. And then they kind of reoccurred for a while. Yeah, me too. Um, and yeah. things would trigger it. So I kind of learnt my triggers of what it was. Yeah. If I hadn't had enough sleep, sometimes it would make it worse. Or yeah. Um, and I've had them ever since, unfortunately. Right. So I do, as like you suffer from them, yeah. which is, is hard. And, and it's crazy how it's not talked about enough because it's really frightening when it happens, really. Yeah, I really, I really like the charity that's so calm mm -hmm. that's associated calm. with this. <laughs> yeah, because um, I went on their Instagram a few times around that time, and I was like, mm. it, I thought it was really good work, which is why it's nice to do this today. But um, the um, yeah, crazy, crazy. Uh, and I guess for me, that was like, I then acknowledged that some of the other experiences I was having with my mind perhaps weren't normal. And that was like a journey of which to some extent, well not to some extent, of which I am still on trying to not be so hard on myself. Mm. Yeah, I have that problem too. Yeah. I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you know what triggers it for you? Is it just moments of feeling insecure or or um, is it things that make you panic and then it gets, or is it just random at, at random that happens? Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I don't actually get panic attacks anymore, weirdly. They've sort of gone but I get a similar, I get sort of, I guess sort of my mind becomes very worried and paranoid and obsessive, which <laughs> is not fun. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. It sounds stressful, Tom. Yeah, it's, there's moments of stress. Uh, but yeah, but you know, I think, I think the thing is, is like, like, it, it's nice to, for a long time I didn't want to talk about this stuff because I was like, even now, actually I still, as I'm talking about it, I'm like, oh, you're such a self-indulgent prick, like, no. just stop going on about yourself. <laughs> That's why we're all here today. Yeah, we're here I, know. To <laughs> I know. It's like it's so embarrassing in a way. Not embarrassing because I feel like it's embarrassing to have these things. But I'm just like, why? Am, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, you're, you're helping a lot of people who are well, listening. Yeah, and I have to remind myself of that. Yeah. I'm just like, it is that I guess through being honest about how you feel, it helps other people realize that we all get these. Uh, we all get these things. We all do. Well, you all, lots of us do. You were saying you kind of feel a bit guilty for talking about it almost. Um, and But do you think things are changing? I mean, especially as a man, talking about this, you know, there is a sort of feeling that men over the years haven't been able to talk about things. Like, there's never been able to talk about their feelings. It's, it's in some way, um, you know, uh, not good for a man not to be strong and all of this mm. stuff. Do you feel like that's... You have that guilt because you've been told that it's not, it is, you know, not good to talk about it? Probably, probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I think there's so many, 
there's so many things we inherit from the sort of the past and the conditioning you know I, I'm not sure I can break down why it is I feel like that but I feel like you know evidently there's a lot of issues with our original idea of or the previous century's idea of what it is to be a man mm. that you know have, 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 have certainly come to light and I feel I definitely think that it would, it's going to require a lot of compassion to fix those um, some of those problems I think I think so many I think so many guys I know still are you know really would uh, I mean I, I genuinely if it wasn't for music and it wasn't for this microphone and this platform that I'm on right now I really don't know if I would sp have spoken up about or I would be talking about how I feel because I think the 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 mode that is most natural to me is to not is to be quiet and to um, I guess quite good work willed in the sense of like I just feel like people have it so much worse than me mm -hmm. and they do they have it a million times worse but I think the silence of the, the lack of emotional The ability to talk about our emotions is the is the cause of so many of, of, of the world's problems. Um, Do you find it easier sometimes to talk through music? Certainly, and I, I definitely am prepared to say things in my songs that I would not even dream of saying <laughs> into like a friend or a family or anything. Yeah. Um, and how how do your could you give us a bit of an insight on how your ideas are formed? I mean, is it something that you feel, something you want to talk about, and it will start as a little lyric idea, or how how does it grow into a song? Um, well, right now, today, I tried to write a song, and I sat at the piano, and all I all I thought about was how the hell have I ever written a song before? <laughs> Because this feels so difficult, and I, everything I'm <coughs> writing is rubbish, and I should just give up and become a gardener. <laughs> uh, because I'd like to become a gardener um, a lot, and um, but then there's other days when I just sit at the piano, and the moment my fingers hit the keys. It, you know, like falls a whole out. song falls out, yeah. Mm. Um, do you feel like, I mean, people say that creative people are very sensitive by nature. Do you feel that when you're feeling things most extreme, the songs flow easier? Or does it not have anything to do with how you're feeling at the time? Feeling things most extreme is a good way of putting it, I think, yeah. The, the yeah that sometimes it's that sometimes it's like a deep state of calm and good things come out of that sometimes, sometimes it's quite hypnotic isn't it you go yeah. into a trance and it kind of just it takes over a bit yeah 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 <laughs> or sometimes you're in you're in a lot of pain and it just you're desperate to get it out yeah yeah both enjoyable moments and sometimes you're just a little bit too at peace and nothing comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely think it's a it's a state that that I recognise when I mean and it definitely comes in sort of like sometimes it can be like a month long and you just get loads of songs out of it and then and then sometimes you need a long time. But yeah, I think I recognise the feeling. It's a definitely a feeling of you, we were talking about. The <laughs> water <laughs> um, What things do you do to calm your? You said you know you've had anxiety in the past with things, and 
to bring in a piece, I mean, you mentioned you meditate, but there are other things. You just mentioned gardening. Is that something that really brings you calm? No, I actually don't garden. But, oh, but you've, got, you've got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, though. I like, I like uh, yeah, it's nice to be amongst nature like that. Mm. Yeah. But um, other things I do. Yeah, what, what gives you inner peace, calm? I feel like my whole day is sort of various things to try and achieve that. Um, I do quite a lot of exercise, so like I run, do yoga and stuff. I find that makes me feel quite calm. I read. Reading makes me feel calm. What are you reading at the moment? I just finished a book actually. Uh, it was really long. And I'm really sad. It's finished. It's called Lonesome Dove. It was by this guy called Larry McCurtry. It was like a western. Nice. Yeah, it was really beautiful, lovely. It was like one of the best books I've read in ages. And I started reading this book um, a couple of nights ago, and it's like a um, detective novel. Um, the Big Sleep, is it? Mm. The Big Sleep? It's like old, it's 20s old. Yeah, I think there's a film. Made of that as well. It's a film. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I read a lot of self help books as well. Oh, yeah, so do I. <laughs> I love a good self help book. <laughs> Endless self help books. I read, I read two this year. I read, I reread The Power of Now. Oh, Eckhart Tolle. Which yeah, is great. I recommend anyone who wants to read a good book read that. And I also read this one called, by Michael Singer called The Untethered Soul. I think we all get to a certain age where we just start reading books like that. I, I find never used to be interested in it, and now I can't get enough. I can't read them publicly. <laughs> no. I, I feel too I can't read them on the train. I have my hand on the cover <laughs> just because I feel too embarrassed. I started reading one that was awful the other day. It was like, oh, this is just the worst fucking thing I've ever read. <laughs> I've watched lots of YouTube videos as well. Yeah. <laughs> can't be admitting this. This <laughs> the art of not the art of not giving a fuck. Yeah. That's so bad. Yeah. I read this thing. I was like, <laughs> it's just too far. This is just so glib and like when it's so extreme. Like when people like pick out these sort of like philosophies of like this will solve all your problems. <laughs> like just don't give a fuck about anything. It's like, it's like what? It's like, like you can't just like, change your <laughs> turn your brain off. <laughs> it's like nihilistic. Yeah. Um, you're now an independent artist, yeah, yeah. Um, which is the way a load of musicians are going now. Um, why did you want to do things differently, and do you think the current sort of record deal structure is harmful for artists' mental health? Well, uh, I think that um, where is my Manager of this, don't slander your <laughs> old record label too much. <laughs> Hands over the ears. Just trying to choose. <laughs> the the uh, do I think that the the current record label model is bad? Yeah, I mean, obviously you've chosen well, the major labels or major labels. I think, yeah. I think it's constantly evolving. I wouldn't like to say to be honest with you, mm. but like, I think. I think it's different for everyone. Like, like I actually feel very fortunate to be in the position I'm in right now. Uh, I think more than mental health. I don't think I could say that 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 being on a major label is worse for your mental health than being independent. I don't. I think it's sort of irrelevant to anyone. You know, there's a million different scenarios where you could be both, but. I think that I think purely from like a business point of view like like you know the 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 type of deal that I was on on a major label is in <laughs> like at mo like it definitely felt like daylight robbery at moments right. uh but I think, okay, so like I think that as I'm incredibly grateful 
from my relationship that I had with Sony, I signed to them for 10 years. I think there's definitely moments, just to be completely honest, that I look back at, say, certain songs of mine that I wrote myself, I produced myself, I sang them, I played them. This is like a piece of, of, of music which basically very few other people have any involvement in and it's a complete creation of I look back on myself as a 22 year old just make this thing yourself and if I'm to look at it from a point of view of like I don't know what the gain is of telling a I don't know like I'm just from the point of view of business it's insane that like I get this a tiny share of that whilst a big corporation makes loads and loads of money out of it every year and they make practically nothing out of it it's like that's an insane thing that but I don't feel any bitterness about it because I just feel like I'm also incredibly fortunate to have had the career and I you know I've got I'm you know feel weird talking about money, I'm buying with money, it's like, you know, I'm, it's, but I do think there's moments where, you asked about mental health and major record companies, no, I think that, I think it's, there's definitely moments where I feel like it's like a lose-lose situation, it's like, if you succeed, you make no money, and if you fail, you, you fail. Mm. So it's like, but like I, I, I don't I don't know if I don't feel like that's really what we're here to talk about. So it's, I feel weird talking about that. But like, do do I? But then I do. Do I think that the music industry right now, with people's mental health, um, I don't think there's, I don't think there's enough, uh, like, I wouldn't say unions, but I don't think there's enough. Like, it's the same with modelling. Like my my girlfriend's a model, uh, and like. You've just got friends and models. I, it's the same with music. It's like you've you've got unregulated capitalism, and people making loads and loads of money, and there's no like independent body. There's no central body that's that's like looking after young artists that get signed, who are getting no other advice than the labels. And if I was to start a charity, I'd love to start a charity that 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 looked after artists that get signed to major record companies and then get dropped and then just uh, are just like sat there just like what the fuck do I do now I was going to go to university I was going to do this like I just I'm getting a bit carried away with myself I, I, I just feel that um, my feeling towards major rep companies is they're there to toast the glass of champagne but they're not there when it doesn't work out yeah. and I think the deal should be that you're there for both the, the, the price you pay to, to, to even get in the room to clink the champagne is, is that you've got to be there when it's you know the, the wheels are falling off and I think that nine times out of ten Sadly, with music, it doesn't work out, and it and you know it's it's a small, pyra you know the, it's a pyramid with a very uh, it's, 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 there's not much room at the top, so it's like I'm covering a lot of ground here. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> it's really, no, it's all really interesting. I feel so. It's you feel a sense of 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 a bit of freedom that it's kind of now your own rules in a way, and that moving yeah. forward, yeah, you're making the decisions in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think the, I think generally speaking, the world is getting better at, at, at looking after people in the arts and stuff. I think, I think, I just hope it doesn't get veneer. It, it's like a lot of things. Like I saw something the other other day on Nate's Instagram. It's like World Mental Health Day, and you've got like 
all these big corporations going, it's okay not to be okay, but one of the corporations is like BAE Systems who like make weapons that bomb people. And I'm like, why are you getting involved in World Mental Health Day? Like, you kill people. Like, and my, my, my worry is that these things become kind of trivialized and, and, and corporatized and monetized and in our pursuit of something good and actually something pure and, and, and good-willed and well-intentioned, we end up, money just ends up eating it all up, you know? Like, because the money always wins. It's always the case. It's like, it's, it's profit over everything. And I think my experience in music is that no matter how well-intentioned people may be, it's still money. Mm. And that's the sort of reality of it, I think. Yeah. The sad, cynical reality. <laughs> um, so I kind sorry, of Sorry, that was very dark, I'm sorry. Everyone. No, I mean, I, I really want to say thank you for your honesty. I think you've been such an amazing guest. You've been so open and honest oh, about everything. Thank so you. thank you, appreciate Thanks. that a lot. Um, I do want to kind of ask you guys if you've got any questions and open up the audience. Um, if anyone's got any questions for just put your hand up and, and and ask. Throw it over to you guys. No worries if you don't. Anyone? <laughs> Martin's gone. Tell us about the fight with Ukrainian Oh, yeah. It's such a moment. Yeah. Oh, because I was doing a... In the Romania, right? Yeah, the... Yeah, the um, I was doing a, I was doing a gig in Bucharest for the re Ukrainian refugees. Actually, at like a, a fundraiser thing in like a stadium, actually, or a, an arena. And um, and then a friend of mine runs uh, Choose Love, you know, the refugee charity. Josie. Yes, she's a friend of mine as well. Yeah. Oh, awesome! <laughs> yeah, I love Josie, yeah. and she. Um, and we were talking about going out there and just like raising some more awareness and money and ends up, the intention was just to go to the train station and just sort of help out. But then we, someone had a keyboard, so ends up performing and it was like this mad experience because it all, it was in Bucharest train station, which was like where a lot of the refugees were coming directly from Ukraine. Um, so they were arriving off the trains and I was performing, which felt really strange, but it was a really beautiful moment. And it was, I met, we ended up taking this um, old professor, he was like in his 70s, we ended up taking him to this sort of like, like hostel thing that they, the charity had set up. And he was, and we had a translator and he was telling us all about him leaving his home and, did you get the idea from? Was it with Josie sort of chatting and created what, it, or did what, you just think I've got to do something? Well, I was going out there anyway to be Chris to do this concert, which we got asked to do, and then we just wanted to, you know, I had the day free, so I was like, oh, I'll just do. I think I think we went out a day early and thought because I've got a relationship with Choose Love, so I thought this was a a nice opportunity to raise some money and and um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I've like I really. The refugee thing has always been like, I've been involved in that quite a bit over the years. Like, I went to. Do you remember when, the, when there was the um, the jungle uh, in Calais? Mm -hmm. When they had the they had the camp, there was like a big camp of. It was like a few thousand or five thousand refugees, mostly from Syria and, and Africa. Mostly from Syria, though, when we were. When there was the as you know Assad regime was in full swing, and um, I had the opportunity to go to this Calais camp with Jews Love, and we actually set up this whole gig in the camp. It was just like fucking horrendous. The French police just setting fire to these people tents, and you know just. <coughs> 
anyway, but then you, always when you do those things, or my experience of doing those things, is there's this strange ex- feeling you're left with. So you're left with like the feeling of anger and frustration that people can lack so much compassion and be so unempathetic or apathetic. But then simultaneously you meet some of these refugees and never is like the human spirit in such visibility. It's like people, you know, they just like inspiring resilience and kindness and, and it's like it just sort of simultaneously breaks your heart and just also inspires you to, to as a human being. It's like crazy. Um, but it seems to me that over the next decades, this I think as the climate gets worse and you know the, st- the, the, st- the st- stability of politics becomes worse and worse. It's going to be a growing issue of people, of migrants, and it's so awful, these, like, fucking pretty Patels, and, like, sending them to, I mean, it's just, like, the inhumanity of it. It's just, like, they're just people like you and I, and just, like, it's just mind-blowing lack of compassion. It's 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 amazing that um, you're using your platform as well to you know to help in, in well such a big I do way. I don't really do as anyway I don't do as much as I should I should it sounds like you've done far more than most so <laughs> oh, I don't I don't know it's, it's not I don't know I don't know how I don't the, yeah it's difficult that one but Josie's amazing it's so incredible what she does I do want to talk about just before we leave um, your new single is out on Friday and it is so beautiful. Oh great! I, I listened to a little clip on your Instagram. Oh, nice. and it sounds absolutely amazing, and it's called "Sad Alone." Flying. Oh, flying! Yes, Sorry. Yes. Sorry. I listened to "Sad Alone." What was that? That was one that came out uh, a few like I thought it was a month ago. Oh, there we go. It's I like that one too. So it's there you go. It's <laughs> but you have a new coming up on Friday called yeah. "Flying." Flying. Yeah. Could you yeah. could you explain what that's about? Um, that uh uh. I'm so useless at talking about uh, the music, but like, no, I, I guess it's similar to the two previous songs that come out recently. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm really rubbish at talking about it, but like, okay. I, re- I really, I really like it. I'm really excited for you too. We're all gonna tune in on Friday then. <laughs> yes. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you. Thank you very it's much. It's been an amazing interview, and yeah, you've been. It's been a privilege, really. Thank you. Very thank much. you for your honesty and openness, Pleasure. and Thanks. thank you guys for being here today. Should we so, sorry for uh, so sort of whittling on about that. <laughs> I apologise to you. Thank you for listening, putting up with me. Thank you so much. Thanks.